Greetings and salutations to all you folks out there. I've got a replay for you today from the Open Palms classic map, and this is going to be a roughly average Joe's matchup. I'm going to go ahead and run through the teams just to get everybody an introduction, and then we will dive directly into the action. As always, guys, I need your replay, so please link or attach the replay file to an email to brinkoinsanity at gmail.com. The link is in the description. Um... And that would help me out tremendously. I do need replays all the time, pretty much. Um, let's go ahead and introduce these guys. We've got Black Al, who is taking the orange color as Cybern. Cybern for air as well. Morgulus Prime, I say air. That is a bad habit that comes from playing way too many team maps. There's not necessarily an air slot on open palms. There really isn't. This guy is center. And then we've got Roke taking Cybern as well in the brown color. On the north end so triple cybern for the left side I'm not sure if that was planned or not but whatever the case may be it is there legendary taking UEF in the southern side of the um, right hand team sins taking the gray color as seraphim that would be well I don't know he has rusted up to the point where he may legit be a 1400 he was approaching 2k at one point I think and then bully dozer taking blue UEF on the north side. So we have everybody represented except for Aeon and definitely Cyber and Heavy on the left side team. Right off the bat, we've got a little bit of aggression. Roke is sending out a hunter. That is going to be queued up with move orders all the way around the back side. I do believe that this engineer is going to get killed. We've got a radar, um, a scout rather, Sent out with that hunter that will be let it pick up a little bit of intel and hopefully snag that engineer. Nope, it is going to run directly by. Oh well, I had high hopes for it, but apparently it is going to just head towards the back. Not that that's a bad thing. If you do get all the way to the back here, you will deny the expansioneer that will inevitably be headed back there from the center player. So either way, you will get your mass out of that mech marine unless it gets spotted by a bomber or some such other thing. Looks like we have a ton of land factories going down for Black Owl. He is planning on a whopper of a spam. Maybe we'll see someone die to Manta spam. That would be kind of hilarious and make my day. It always warms my heart when the Cybern Master Race kills someone with T1 tanks. That's right, I said it. I am a Cybern fan. I know it's been a year I've had the channel up, and I have never specifically stated whether I am entirely for one faction or another but as a lot of you have figured out by now I do love me some cybern that hunter is going toe to toe with two strikers and I don't think it really has any chance it is theoretically possible to kill a tank with a mech uh, not a mech marine a lab of any kind if you micro heavily enough but versus two you pretty much stand at zero chance four mantis coming down as a raiding party they're going to run head first into an ACU, which is pretty much the worst thing that can possibly happen to a tiny group of tanks like that. We do have a successful engineer kill right down here from Roke's Hunter. It was lying in wait that entire time, and it is now going to try to kill off a mass extractor. There is a single striker headed back, but I think that mass extractor will go down before it gets there. Light though the damage may be, damage is being dealt by that little unit. Blackout chilling out with his homies. Sitting there in the middle of all of his mantis. You know, it is always a sunny day in Supreme Commander, at least most of the time. And the scenery is quite beautiful, if you take enough time to pay attention to it. Well, let's check in with the Ecos here real quick. That 76 number is a lie. 25 mass per tick is going to give Sins the lead in the Eco War. That's thanks to that little T2 mechs there that went up very, very early. Bully Dozer is second with 22, and then we got a couple of 19s and some other numbers thrown in there that are blipping around thanks to a Reclaim. Legendary is going to be going for a T1 Transport, and it looks like for the most part everybody is doing fine. Hard mass stall for Black Owl, Bully Dozer, and the rest of the gang look pretty well balanced. Roke is also fairly mass stalled. We've got a Transport out for Sins as well. Looks like one of them will get one expansion, and one of them will get the other. He is going to be sending quite a few units, possibly some combat units. 
We'll have to see what happens with that. Actually, he is Seraphim. That means he's got the eight clip transport. Maybe we'll see some arty drops in the back. Once the center ACU has moved out of the home base, this is actually prime territory for an arty drop. You will be able to snag at least one next kill. There are rarely tanks back in here, and usually people build all of their power back in this little area. So if you can drop artillery back there, the effect is usually devastating. I am sad that this hunter stayed over here. I'm glad that it's alive, and it did do a fair little bit of harassment. But if it had been placed all the way towards the back, that engineer never would have gotten that point defense down, and that expansion would not be happening. Sins is producing his own land unit, sending some towards the front. I don't think any of this has been scouted by the other team. Let's take a look. See, nope, not a single scout to be had. That is a bad position to be in. That means they have no idea that there's artillery and transports back here. These, this guy can jump in there and get all the way around the back side without too much trouble, I would think. There's not a whole lot of intervening units. Actually, I don't see a single solitary air unit for the entire North team. There's an air factory, and there's an air scout. There we go. Finally getting on track. We do have an edge-built factory here. If you place an engineer right on the cliff edge, you can build a factory up in the clear. And that will be able to produce engineers, which are now spreading out. Unfortunately, I don't think he knows that there is a land factory over there. And that he needs to be producing combat units. Otherwise, this is going to win. Because we're already producing T1 artillery. And he got a nice handy-dandy little radar down. Going to let him gather all of the intel that he needs. BC Sin sending that transport over. Let's see if it's on the radar. It has been ping, but there's nothing to intercept it. This is the worst possible situation to be in because you have it scouted. You know what it is. You know it's coming and you have no way to kill it. There's no mobile anti-air. Ah, there's one right there. Right after I said it, there's no interceptors other than that one way over there that just got produced. It's going to be a bad time, but there's also bad things happening on the southern end. Let me zoom in on this artillery fire, and then we'll go check down there. Prioritizing the land factory, which is only producing engineers and anti-air at the moment. It's going to kill it right off the bat. That means there's no potential for tanks in the back, and the carnage will be devastating. Legendary, I believe you're dead, mate. You got completely and utterly surrounded by the T1 spam. Now, thankfully, you're going to take it all with you when you die due to the glorious... Nope. Pulling all the units off to the side. Brilliant maneuver by Black Owl. Get all of your T1 clear before that ACU goes nuclear. That way you'll have a lot of units left over to run over another position. This, though, is bad news for the Northern team. No, they didn't lose an entire player. And all of that stuff is going to go poof thanks to the glory of no share conditions. But they did lose at least one. I think only one maybe two that might be a t2 mass extractor they lost all the home mass extractors their center player is losing all of his power down to 300 income per tick ish and some of that is from overflow a lot of that is from overflow it's not looking very good for the center slot here and basically the left side is disintegrated for the southern team sins does have the gun upgrade on his commander though that is going to do wonderful things for his ability to wipe out all of the units on the left-hand side. But Black Owl does have the gun upgrade as well, so it is going to be evenly matched, I do believe. A nice little number of tanks and a couple of artillery hanging out in the back here for Sins. This is how you should be doing. Uh, Sins is prioritizing the tanks over the ACU until he gets out of range of all the tanks. If you're hammering the tanks with your ACU, you're decreasing the damage potential of your opponent's force. If you're only shooting the enemy ACU, well, then they're tanking the damage. But in this case, with the units not there, Black Owl is toast. My hypothetical does not stand in the current realistic situation. Black Owl is history. Sins is going to stand victorious in the midst of the flame. Look at that cool guy explosion. He's walking away and not even looking back. How do you like that? All right, there he goes. That means all life has ceased to exist on the left half of the map. The left side, rather. 
if you look at it from this orientation where the teams are facing left side. Um, so both of these teams are going to have to do some expansion, but it looks like the southern side is in a better position overall thanks to the fact that their center player has not had all of his mechs killed. Roke does have the gun upgrade and stealth. He is going to be creeping up on Bully Dozer, who looks like he has the... Actually has no upgrades on his commander. No T2, no gun. That is a sticky situation to be in because that commander is going to be able to kill T1 point defense with impunity thanks to the cloak, or rather stealth. It is not cloak, cloak is the second upgrade. And he has more than enough tanks with him to lay waste to this entire base. I'm not sure why Bully Dozer is pulling all of his units to the back. That does not make a whole lot of sense to me. The Kamikaze T1 bombers do, however. Sins has moved to T2. That puts the mighty Ilshiva on the field. The greatest of the T2 units by far. Well, I say that and it's kind of tongue-in-cheek. All of the T2 units have a place. The Ilshivas are arguably the strongest. And it does kind of help make up for the Seraphim's weak, weak T3. I'm glad that they got touched by the rebalance, but they're still kind of on the weaker end of the T3 units. Bully Dozer needs to get the hell away from all of those units. Because if he doesn't, he is going to get Mantis swarmed like his southern teammate did. He's got all these tanks back here, and he's not using them. They are rushing to the front, but his ACU is going to soak a pile of damage before they get there. Losing his two front factories, losing his Hydro, that means he probably doesn't have overcharge. He does have a little bit of positive power, but it's going to take him a while to charge those up. Land that overcharge right there. Come on, you can do it. Seven kills of that if you land it. That was a good one right there. Got to use that overcharge to its maximum potential. The Mantis, I was about to say the Mantis have been dealt with, but there are more trickling in from the north side, and there's the T2 have our first Rhino on the field. That is going to make life very, very complicated for Bully Dozer. I don't think he will be able to hang on to his position for much longer. Those Ilshivas dealing with the T1 artillery rather well. The long range does help. Just got to dodge around a little bit and avoid some of that fire so those things don't stun you. The stun on the Medusa is awesome. Not if you're fighting against it, but when you have it for you, it is a great thing to have. Bully Dozer should not be wandering this far out into the abyss. Look at the wreckage on that battlefield. Lots of tasty, tasty mass. Not entirely sure why Roke is pulling back. He has enough units with him. He could stay. He does outrange the other ACU, and that other one is down to 3,500 health. Sins was way far across the battlefield. He's probably trying to lock down all of this reclaim. Look at the amount of land factories going down. He knows he's going to assimilate all of the eco from the left side, and he's going to have to cope with the spam from the right side once Bully Dozer finally gets plowed under. I think Bully Dozer has a problem with overteching. You can see he's got three Tech 2 mass extractors and simply did not have enough ACU upgrades or units to deal with the Roke problem. And those shiny T2 mass extractors really don't do you much good when your base is in shambles. Mantis just kind of wandering around in the back, slowly eliminating the build power. That's the last thing you want to have happening. See so here, pulling 29 mass per tick, positive mass now. He barely has enough build power to do anything at all. Ilshiva is going to start wading into these units. That is the key advantage of the Ilshiva is the range. They can kite almost all T1. Work very, very well. If they can kill that engineer before the point defense is done, then Sins will be able to secure this left side expansion. Margulis Prime is just having more and more problems dealing with what's getting thrown at him. Sins not only got his entire expansion locked down except for those two mass extractors right there which gives him a whopping 115 nope 73 i was about to say it and it just wasn't true because that was probably a reclaimed number so in the 80 mass per tick range 
income versus 33 for the next highest player who would be Roke. However, Roke is going to have this glorious amount of mass to reclaim more than enough to rebuild any army his heart desires. As long as he gets an engineer over there to do it or lays down a factory with his ACU to make engineers. Yolshev is moving in to take up residency in the rear of this base. Well, now it looks like he's doing a little bit more of a wrap around. He would be able to go all the way in right here and nothing would stop him. There is a single point defense going down, which he could have killed. But hey, when you got an ACU right here, why bother with that? He's going to tear into Morgulus. Morgulus does not have the gun upgrade and Sins does. So that ACU by itself would probably be able to kill him. But then you pack in all the Ilshavas around it and you have a severe dropping health problem. Ilshav even coming in from the back. Going to die to T1 point defense, but hey, it contributed. 3, 2, 1, and... Oh my word. Boom! There it goes. I was about to say, not sure why that isn't killing him. So now we have, essentially, Morgulus Prime versus Sins. I'm sorry, Roke versus Sins. Morgulus Prime is the one who died. Talk about a Freudian slip. That was the name on the screen, and I just said it. Oh, well. So we now have basically the northern curve of the map owned by Roke and the southern curve owned by Sins and Bully Dozer just kind of over here off to himself hiding in the corner with his little land factory and hoping that no one finds him. The problem with expanding this far with all of his units is that Sin has now exposed his base to attack. We have a lot of Rhinos and many T1 that are about to come into this base. Roke needs to hit him fast and hard before any of those units can respond. It looks like Sins is going all in to crush this base as well. So we're basically playing musical chairs in Supreme Commander. If he can succeed in killing this T2 HQ, that will do wonders, absolutely glorious things for his chances versus Sins. If he, however, sits here and soaks damage from incoming Ilshavas, it will not turn out so well for him. Knock out that HQ and there will be no more in Ilshavas to be had. Oh, Walls, you stand in memoriam of the white player as the only remaining unit to grace this map with your noble color. Sins is about to start shredding this base. You got two T1 point defense and another going down in the back, but hey, when you got that many Ilshavas and a gun comm, there is no worries when you're facing T1 point defense. Although with five, you might have a chance of staving off the inevitable. Down here on the southern side, it looks like that HQ is going to go down along with four mass extractors. That's got Sins down to 55 mass per tick. Although he is steadily expanding into other areas of the map and he's now streaming units back towards this area. T2HQ is toasty fried. That means that there will be no Ilshavas until one is rebuilt. And these two support factories are basically just going to be really powerful T1 factories. Nicely done on Roke's part. He is now pulling in. Wait for the number. There we go. 35 mass per tick, it looks like, if the numbers are to be trusted. Although his power number is so low, we can probably assume he's power stalling. And he does have enough production in the back. The point defense kind of failed, sort of. It didn't really do any damage to the ACU, which is skirting the outside edge, but it did stop the incursion of those units. So, well, I guess we can. Yeah, it did succeed. We can say that. Um, so his base will be safe. He's going to protect his T2 HQ, but he desperately needs to get power online. He's actually building power down the ridge on the north side. At least it'll be semi-protected. Well, not really, because T1 artillery can easily fire over that cliff face and kill it dead as a hammer. The southern front has finally been stilled. Definitely need to get some engineers in there, though, because that is a buttload of mass that needs to be claimed. Bully Dozer laying down his third land factory, and he's starting to produce a couple of tanks again. But when you've only got five mass per tick income, you know there's really not a whole lot you can do. Roke is uh, basically camping on his spawn, you could say. Sins moving forward once again with a load of T1 tanks. If I were him, I would be building like half artillery because when you have this much base artillery as your best bet of knocking it out, there's not actually that many combat units 
Um, there's a handful of T2 tanks, which you should be overcharging with your ACU. And other than that, I think T1 artillery could actually deal with this threat with the help of a commander. Moving in once again, <clears throat> the mighty fortifications are trying to stand, but when you have a commander all up in your base, the damage potential is pretty crazy. Thankfully, there are a couple of point defense on the job, which the tanks are running into yet again. Holy cow, he just keeps building more point defense in the back. One good thing about fighting in the midst of your own factories is that your factories act as shields. You've basically got a 3,500 uh, health damage soaker. It's going to be able to do a very, very nice job of absorbing hits for the rest of your units. And that was a triple rhino kill with the overcharge there. That's why you don't clump up your tanks next to an ACU. You take a lot of heavy losses very, very quickly. Roke sitting on, let's see, 62 mass per tick. That doesn't seem right. 47 plus a lot of reclaim. And Sins is parked on 42 income and horrifically overflowing mass because he has power issues and build power issues. He needs to be turning Commander on some more build power. Sins is sitting on 4,500 reclaim and Roke on 15k. Whopping high numbers and 1,700 for Bully Dozer. That's a fun name to say, Bully Dozer. Everyone say it with me, Bully Dozer. Yulsev is marching the field on the southern side. T1 is no match for eight or so Yulshavas, actually exactly eight. And these units are not a whole lot of good, honestly. Looks like Roke is actually reclaiming his air factory. Legendary pointing out, Bully, try for T2 air. He has no air defense, which is an accurate statement. There are no mobile flak. There are no stationary anti-air. There are no mobile anti-air. Roke is pretty much out there all on his lonesome. Still producing T2 tanks, which, let's see, do we have a T2 HQ up yet for Sins? I don't think so. Pretty much slugging this out with T1. Roke wandering a little dangerously far. He's got 1,300 health on double veteran C versus a 5 vet. 1,700 health commander. He needs to get back because at this point, Sins can basically tank him and win due to the severe health advantage. <clears throat> Those rhinos are doing a beautiful job of cleaning up T1 for sure, as long as they don't stand still and that happens. So that's the fastest way to lose a T2 tank. Blow for blow trading in 10,500 and 12,000. The T2 units with their heavy damage potential do actually make the difference. Sins needs to overcharge these guys if he's gonna stand a chance. He is getting surrounded. This is not good at all. The tide may have potentially just turned, but he's got 8,000 health left to burn through, same as Roke. He's trying to, he needs to push units up from the back is what needs to happen. Here they come. He's got plenty of units. It's just, they're not with his commander. Red, still at 3,000 health though. That's what happens when you got 4,000 HP to burn through. 2,400 health, 2,200 still in range of the gun com. Under 2,000 and finally going to collide with his own units. 1,600 health left. He's got to overcharge these guys. He has no veterancy left with which to save himself. No more health boosts in the chamber. And there we go. Barely, barely escaped by the hair of his chinny chin chin. That was kind of ridiculously nail biting. And once again, Roke is standing victorious in the middle of a wonderfully large field of mass. Funny how that keeps happening. I think the reclaim numbers pretty much speak for themselves here. 23,000 and counting versus 5,000 and 2,400. So. Yeah, that story pretty much writes itself. You can see why he is overpowering everyone else. Pushing forward once again with his superior number of Mantis and Rhinos. 
There's a T1 point fence up. Hopefully you won't walk too much into that. Need to pay attention. About to have two point defense online, but there goes the last engineer. There we go. That one's going to go offline, stunned by a Medusa. And that's going to be a win for Roke, pushing through and regaining his center player's mass extractor positions. I'm not sure that he'll actually fill them, but as long as he denies them from sins, he should be in a good position. Finally, a push on the southern side. Those Ilshivas are no longer going to be enough thanks to the overwhelming force of Rhinos and um, Rhinos and Mantis put together. If they were swarming, they would be doing better, but at the moment they're letting the Ilshivas kind of skirt towards the outside edge. There's only two left, though, so they are not long for this world. And there they go. No more T2 for Sins. Oh, there's a T2 HQ. It got rebuilt. But he, uh, uh, but why? He rebuilt in his home base that is in danger of being overrun again. If he would have built that T2 HQ back here somewhere, he would have been far, far better off than he is right now. Because he's about to lose it all over again. Really didn't accomplish anything at all with this build right here other than waste mass. It's always a frustrating outcome when you're trying to regain your footing. Bulldozer looks like he's throwing down an upgrade. What could it be? I know not, but we will see in just a few minutes. Maybe the gun. If I were him, if I were him, I would go gun. And then again, if he is trying for air, he could be going T2 for power generators. But that would be kind of dumb because he should just build an air factory and make that T2. And Sins calling the GG. Cannot do this without T2. T2 got killed. It's no use. GG, well played. Roke did fantastically well. His team collapsed. And he was able to just run over two opponents thanks to massive, massive reclaim. I can pretty much put this down. No questions about it. This is all down to the reclaim. Because look at that. 31,000 mass versus 7,000. I know, I know, Sins had a little bit higher income for a while. And that does make a huge difference. But when you're talking about a 23,000 mass discrepancy in reclaim values, that is the game right there. That's all it takes. You have more tanks than the other guy. You're continuously gaining mass fields and reclaiming them and turning them into shiny new combat units. And I mean, at, after a certain point, that's all she wrote. Nothing you can do about it. Just superior numbers doing what they do best. What are we going to die to? We got T1 bombers heading in. We got Mantis. We got Rhinos. What is going to deal the deadly blow? I don't know, but he's got a whopping 18,000 HP on that. That would be a T2 and a gun, plus a couple of veterancy. <clears throat> Funny thing about it, when you've got that many T1 bombers on you, it doesn't matter how much health you have, they still continue to eat away at it. Although it looks like it's going to take a little while to kill this ACU thanks to the veterancy being gained. However, when you run out of veterancy, you run out of health boosts, and I think the health is shedding faster than it is accumulating. I'm gonna dip under 10,000 health in that pass, although he's gonna regen back up above it. I think T1 bombers are gonna be what does it. As a T1 point defense, gonna take out one mantis and die <laughs> because area of effect from t1 bombers that's why and also units bully dozer trying for another pd but i think that's going to be the end of his power yes he has no more power in storage so that means his build time slows dramatically and that is it GG to all players.
That was actually a fun game to watch. That thing flipped back and forth several times during the course of the match. Honestly did not know who won until about, I don't know, maybe two minutes before Sins died. Roke hit the tipping point of production and mass income. Look at the amount of factories on this thing. We've got, let's see, three T2 factories and then a four T2s and a solid dozen land factories with about five air factories. Ridiculous amounts of build power and the mass income to back it up. That is what you call overwhelming force. Alrighty, folks, that's going to wrap it up for me today. As always, thank you guys so much for watching. I will see you on Saturday for the live cast. Don't forget, 6 p.m. Eastern United States time, I will be having a live cast and then playing a game with you guys. So tune in then. Adios, folks.